Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Ian Vermigli. Thanks for being on the show, Ian. Thank you, Whitney. It's a pleasure to be here. Ian is the Vice President of Investments at CrowdStreet, overseeing CrowdStreet Marketplace, an online commercial real estate investment marketplace that has conducted over 275 offerings with over $10 billion of total property value. He's a former senior senior acquisitions officer with a regional private equity real estate firm that has acquired over $4 billion of assets with a focus on office, industrial, and retail properties. He's also a serial entrepreneur with a 20-plus year career spanning private equity, technology, and securities trading. Well, thanks again, Ian, for being on the show. I can already tell you're going to be, you know, you're a perfect guest for us and, and with your experience and track record and, and, but give us a little more about how you got into this business and, and, uh, you know, why, why real estate syndication? Sure. No, absolutely, Whitney. So, you know, my career in real estate investing really began kind of at the conclusion of my securities trading career. Uh, my first career coming out of college was as an equity options market maker. So I stood in a pit and I traded uh, two-sided markets on options for a number of years. And uh, so I was fortunate enough to make some money in the early days uh, and then kind of get a head start in life. And so as I was contemplating kind of the next thing, uh, early 2000s, as you recall, was a bear market. Uh, the, also the kind of the, on, the dawn of online trading. And it, it was clear to me that pit trading you know, as a viable business was going away. So it was really at that point that I started to turn my attention to real estate. I grew up in a real estate family. Uh, my dad was a civil engineer turned general contractor. My mom was a real estate agent. So, I, I mean, I was even as a kid, I was out on apartment properties that my, my parents owned, you know, painting and trashing out units. Uh, so real estate was just in my DNA. So it was really at that point in my career, I had a pivot point. Uh, I wanted to, you know, essentially kind of diversify myself away from the risk that I saw in the market at that time, stop trading, take the money that I had made in the markets and start to kind of build the next phase of my career. So like a lot of investors, I started buying single family homes, I did that in California for a number of years. I turned that into a multifamily syndication business for about five or six years. I acquired apartment buildings in Alabama, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kentucky. And then that transitioned into a real estate private equity uh, career on the commercial side. As you mentioned, joined that group. We did about $500 million worth of deals while I was there for about four years. Uh, closed deals with some of the biggest institutions in the country. And the culmination of that experience was really what enabled me to transition all of this into my role at CrowdStreet, which is now to essentially oversee an online platform. And now I should say kind of vet and work with other uh, commercial real estate operators on their syndications. Nice, nice. So, you know, I'd like for us to dive into CrowdStreet a little bit, what that is. I think most listeners are, may have never heard of that before. And, and uh, but, you know, based on my understanding, uh, most, most offerings on CrowdStreet are syndications, but they're different than the traditional syndications. And, uh, but, you sure. know, own, uh, yeah, happy to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And just like online syndication, you know, differing from a traditional forms of syndication. Tell us, you know, can you elaborate on that a little bit and what that is? Yeah, absolutely. So what CrowdStreet did, similar to some other platforms, was really harness a piece of legislation dating back to 2013. So the Jobs Act, that was passed in 2012. Uh, and that was, you know, coming out of the downturn, this was how are we going to get some more jobs in the country? led to Title II of the Jobs Act being effective as of September of 2013. And Title II is what we call now 506C of Reg D. So in essence, anybody who's ever syndicated a deal has probably syndicated through 506B of Reg D. That's the you know, private offering. You can go and now solicit your kind of friends and family, up to 34, you know, unaccredited but sophisticated investors, and then up to 99 accredited investors, and then you can go raise some private capital. So what changed 
And what you know, CrowdStreet saw as an opportunity was that in the fall of 2013, 506 c goes live and what that now does is it enables the general solicitation of a private equity offering and in exchange for that general solicitation and so really functionally speaking what general solicitation means is you can advertise it so platforms like crowdstreet looked at that and said hey if you could go and advertise a private equity offering you could put it on a website if you could put it on a website we can make it national and now we could get investors all over the country looking at a deal that has historically been kind of subscribed locally amongst the friends and family, kind of the country club model. The trade-off in, in exchange for that general solicitation is now every single investor in that offering must be accredited and they must be verified as accredited by a third party. So in our early days, we also built an integration to a third party platform which facilitates that online credential or certificate to solve for the third party verification. So that, that was really it. In essence, general solicitation of Reg D offerings was what enabled the real estate crowdfunding movement to get going, enable a platform like CrowdStreet to get up, start doing some deals, and start working with syndicators all over the country on an array of product, product types. Nice. I appreciate you explaining that. And, you know, but like during your uh, private equity days, you know, how, how would your team capitalize deals? Would you, would you syndicate them? We would. Uh, now what was interesting is during my private equity days, we kind of had a twofold approach, which would oftentimes blend together. Uh, my private equity firm had really three sources or three buckets of capital. It had our balance sheet capital. It had capital that it could raise through our own high net worth investors who were in essence our friends and family. And then we would raise the preponderance of our capital through large institutional sources, you know, kind of the, the household names of institutional private equity. And so when we would go and, and do a deal, we would oftentimes form a joint venture. That was our typical approach, joint venture with a large private equity group. So for example, we might be going and acquiring a $100 million property. Well, that, that $100 million property is going to need 30 to $40 million worth of equity. So in a typical 90-10 JV structure, if it's a $40 million equity check, the institutional JV is going to come in and provide $36 million of that equity, and then look to the sponsor to pro provide $4 million. It's within that $4 million that they would then look at our firm and say, look, your firm doesn't have to provide all of the $4 million. We know that's, that's still a pretty big check for a regional operator. Why don't you guys provide one to two and then go syndicate two to three from your friends and family? So that's exactly what we would do on a one-off basis. We would put together then, you know, the pitch book, show it to the investors. Hey, we're going to go buy this office tower with this institution. Here's the business plan. Here's the underwritten returns. Would you like to come participate? Um, so it was interesting. So in, in, in essence, we would be both in a, you know, JV and a, but, but then also syndicate that on our side, you know, simultaneously. Nice. So, you know, what are some of the key differences that, that you see in the, you know, in the institutional JVs versus syndications? Yeah. So, you know, just like any capital solution, there's pros and cons to, to these different types of capital. So when we think about the JV capital, the large institutional LP, for the pros, you know, I'd say the number one thing is you get large checks. You know, if you're going to go try to buy a $100 million property, you got to amass a lot of capital pretty quickly. And those institutions can take down uh, that kind of a deal, no problem, and help you get it done. Uh, in addition, I'd say that once you get one done, and I would say that in the business, we do talk about that. It is all about getting the first deal done with that institution. After that, it is possible to get into a decent cadence with those partners. Um, you start looking at similar deals in other markets with them. And hopefully your goal is that we're gonna do two or three deals a year with that same partner on, on, for multiple years. You know, when we think about the cons of this model, kind of some basic stuff. First, control. You don't really have it. A lot of syndicators, you think about it's, if it's your deal and you're at, you're at, the investors are your investors. In this case, in an institutional JV, it's very much, it's a partnership of which the operator has provisional control, but absolutely not absolute control. Uh, that's where the nuances of negotiating the JV comes into place. I've been in deals, for example, that took eight weeks to get one done with a ton of legal back and forth and almost wondering if we were able to really kind of accept 
the terms uh, of the institutional capital partner. You know, but as you can imagine, if a group's willing to write you a $36 million check and go into a deal with you, they're gonna have a lot of strings attached to that money, including the ability to toss you out of the deal if you kind of so much as hiccup. Um, you know, and I think in conjunction with that, that kind of deal can be tough to close. Uh, they're gonna have, even during the due diligence process, they're gonna have a lot of strong opinions. Uh, these capital partners have their own analytical teams, they have their own deal managers, they are, they are bigger than you as an operator, right? They're managing billions while you're managing maybe a billion of capital. From that standpoint, you get into a deal and things go, you learn some stuff in due diligence, all of a sudden that, op, you know, that LLP partner is coming up to different conclusions in terms of pricing, whether or not you should even just stay in the deal, period. And so that's where you can kind of see that if the deal is, gets a little bit strained, then the alignment of interest of the LP partner and the operator can get a little bit out of whack. And that's where you can see the deal kind of go off the rails pretty quickly. And so I would say that as part of that is to understand that these relationships, while they can be good, they can be strong and they can actually last multiple years, I describe them as a marriage of convenience. The relationship at its core is usually mostly about the deal and then about the operator. And that means that the LP can kind of quickly and easily shift its preferences move on to different criteria that may or may not be in the region that you're particularly good at acquiring deals. And so what you thought you put a lot of effort into building what you thought was gonna be a lasting relationship, maybe it's one, maybe it's two or three, and then it's kind of done. And then they kind of come back to you and say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you. Maybe we don't do another deal in this cycle. Maybe it's next cycle. And so you know, then there's a little bit of disappointment on the operator side. I think the final thing to think about on this kind of capital is that the cost of it, you know, the preferred returns and the splits, they can be higher. LPs are tough negotiators and they use the power of the purse. So, and that is particularly, if you have to keep in mind, you have to understand that an LP in many cases is promoting its capital as well. So they're gonna turn around and have to, they have to give their net to investor returns to their source of capital, which is typically a pension. I want to tell you about an upcoming real estate investing conference hosted by my good friend, Joe Fairless. Every February, Joe brings his best ever conference to Denver, which brings together the top high-level experienced real estate speakers and sponsors that has proven to be the best ever networking, content, and strategies to help grow your portfolio. The earlier you buy, the more you save. Ticket prices increase weekly, so you want to buy today. I attended in 2018, and I can guarantee you do not want to miss this conference. February 22nd and 23rd, 2019 in Denver. Go to besteverconference.com to reserve your seat today. That's besteverconference.com and use hashtag Whitney to save 10%. That's hashtag Whitney. So what about the, you know, some of the uh, scenarios that uh, online syndication works best for? You know, what would we be looking at there I mean, as a scenario? What's going to be the best one for some type of online syndication like CrowdStreet? Yeah. So, you know, as you mentioned, kind of over the course of our history, since April of 2014, we've now been, I think, over well over 280 deals. I think it's 283 right now, if I were to be specific. Uh, I would say the most, the, the most successful scenario is going to be in that just sub-institutional deal space. So a typical scenario, for example, would be a $30 million deal. That deal may require $9 million of total equity. So if you think about that size of an equity check, it's too small for most institutional capital partners to, to consider. Uh, the opening volley for most of the groups that we worked with in my past was 10 million. Um, but at the same time, $9 million is a lot of money and it's hard to assemble that kind of capital relatively quickly uh, when it's not coming from one source. So what we would typically see, and this is again, what I would say almost the ideal scenario, is if that sponsor approaches us with that $30 million deals with a $9 million total equity check requirement, they may have circled 5 million of it by the time they approach CrowdStreet. And the, and the value prop mostly is, hey, CrowdStreet, we got 9 million circled. If you can help fill the $4 million equity gap, we got a deal, this deal looks great. It may be the best deal we've seen in a while, and the reason why that deal might look so good is that a $30 million deal is oftentimes sourced through a relatively inefficient process. Uh, it might, typical scenarios that we're gonna see is gonna be a broken escrow. Hey, we were the second bidder, maybe third place the first go around. 
uh, but we seem to demonstrate a lot of credibility through the bidding process. Turns out the highest bidder can't perform. We're the first call, deals dropping, it's into our laps. We're, we're leveraging that to our advantage. Pricing now looks very attractive, 10, 15% below what we originally bid when we lost. That's a scenario we love to see. Uh, another one that you, you can see is another, you know, the typical off-market transaction. You know, you get the first and only look. Uh, we've had some tremendous success when a scenario of which an operator had acquired a property previously with another seller. Maybe it was a larger transaction. That would be the, the, the best case scenario is, hey, we acquired a $100 million property with a, a seller three or four months ago. They liked that process. They came back to us and said, hey, we've got this. 25, $30 million asset. It's kind of been, it's a leftover in a, in a portfolio of assets. We honestly haven't really paid much attention to it in a few years. Would you just give us a bid on it? That group looks at that deal and says, yep, we think it's worth 30 million, but we'll give you 25 and this is why. And then that part, and then that seller says, that's fine. I'm not really convinced. I'm not really concerned about pricing. I just want a quick and easy deal done. I've closed with you in the last quarter. I know you guys are real. Let's go do a deal. So those are, I mean, and, and there, it can take on multiple forms as well. But I guess my point is, is that sometimes you find these deals that are kind of these tweener, too, too big for the small guy, too small for the big guy, that can then fall in the lap of these operators. And when you acquire it, you put that amount of capital into it, and you improve it and sell it. Then ironically, you can actually exit it into a more institutional quality market. Maybe the deal is 50 million at exit, and now you're getting the, the 10 to $15 million equity check size institutions and you know, interested in the deal, all of a sudden that leads to a more efficient process. You see a little bit of cap rate compression and now you've earned yourself a nice return on a four to five year hold. Nice. So, you know, Ian, with your, with your, I mean, such a large experience or track record, uh, but both on the institutional uh, joint ventures as well as uh, the direct syndication, you know, why have you decided to focus on, uh, particularly on online syndications now? Well, I'd say for a couple of reasons. First, uh, when I first joined CrowdStreet, I had had the privilege or kind of the opportunity, I guess, within my previous firm to study the space for about six months. And so I, over that time period, and we were studying it from the perspective of should our firm do it? And if so, how? Um, at the end of that six months of studying, we determined that we should probably start doing this. Uh, I guess you would say that, you know, I quote unquote drank the Kool-Aid on the space. So I first believed in the space and felt that it had, you know, great legs as to become a substantial plank of capital markets. Just like online, you know, e-commerce, wasn't going to make brick and mortar go away. All those traditional sources were still going to be there. But I did see that online syndication had an opportunity to carve out a meaningful space in capital markets. So I think that was number one. I just kind of bought into it. And then two, I would say that when I look at, you know, syndication in general, from an operator perspective, I always like to say that I feel like there are three to the stool of capital formation. And they're really one is pricing, two is control, and three is certainty of execution. So when we think about that from an online syndication perspective, online syndication has always offered good pricing. We leverage technology and an online platform to go out and raise capital at extremely efficient prices, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the offline options. Second, online syndication, just like offline syndication, offers control. Just like any other syndication, online investors are relying upon the expertise of the sponsor to look to build long-term relationships. So just as many of your listeners might, might experience, the investor is really looking to the operator first and the deal second. Like I said, that's very different than the institutional world, right? It's all about the deal than the operator. It's an entirely different world when it comes to syndication. It's one that I think is, I personally prefer. I think it's a more sustainable model because if a good operator is doing good deals, on average, they're gonna go well. Not every deal is gonna go well, but if you treat investors right over the long term, you can build really meaningful long-term relationships and get to the point where you can really you know, rely, you know, gain reliability on your pool of investors. The third piece is certainty of execution. You know, I would say that Historically speaking, when it pertains to online syndication, this has always been the Achilles heel, right? 
we, we, would, we started off in 2014 raising three, four, five hundred thousand dollars per deal. And I guess so fortuitously, I would say that now in 2018, this is really changing. Our pl platform has grown and scaled tremendously since then. We're now raising roughly $35, $35 million per month, sorry, across all deals. And we're regularly hitting five million plus on a single asset in under 30 days. And, you know, and if, we, if we look at where we've been, where we've come from, and the rate at which we're growing, we, we actually believe it's realistic to think that we're gonna be raising over a billion dollars a year in 2020. So when I think about that, that's what kind of gives me the optimism that that third leg of the stool is really starting to materialize. And if it does, kind of really to answer your question, Whitney, at that point, I feel like we have the killer solution and that's what gives me huge optimism and a lot of success going forward. Wow. Yeah. One, one billion dollars on an annual basis. That's impressive. And, you know, t tell the listeners, you know, what else do we need to know about CrowdStreet before we have to go? What, um, th that I don't even know to ask you. CrowdStreet is, you know, it's... sure. Uh, I would say for the thing for listeners to know about CrowdStreet is, you know, we're one of the early entrants to the space. Uh, we're, we're a VC backed startup, like many of the other early entrants to the space. Uh, we have been fortunate to now secure a leadership position within this industry that's still very young, uh, maturing day by day, week by week. Uh, you know, we love to build long-term relationships both on the sponsor side and on the investor side. I think from to the one thing that sponsors should know is when we think about online syndication, I would say or myths that are out there is that sometimes I would say that a syndicator who shows up on our, on our doorstep has never been, you know, ha doesn't know a lot about how this part of the industry works, has heard maybe out there that the, in that the investors are less sophisticated and they don't have the ability to invest like offline investors. And I can absolutely tell you that that is categorically incorrect. The investors, at least all I can speak about are the investors on my platform. And I can tell you that those investors are both sophisticated and they're very high net worth and they have participated in offline syndication. Now, the piece that is different about online syndication and perhaps where some of these myths stem from is that, yes, it is true that on average, the check sizes are gonna be smaller. On our platform, the average check size is about 50K. And so from the perspective, but the key thing to keep in mind is that investor is putting $50,000 into that deal because they're going to put $50,000 into 12 to 15 deals on the platform. They're going to use their experience online to build relationships with those, with those sponsors. And then over time, they're going to figure out who, who is the best of the best. And when they do, then they're going to triple, quadruple, quintuple down. So these investors that we're meeting every day do have the ability to write large checks. They could, we've actually seen investors write seven figure checks even on our platform, but really it's more about building a portfolio at lower investment amounts. And so the part that makes that work is the technology. I would tell you that, you know, raising money 25 to $50,000 at a time offline, that can be challenging and it can be challenging to amass the amount of capital to take down real deals within, you know, a finite period of time. However, when we do that online, we're leveraging everything about technology, right? We're blasting a deal out to the nation and we're having sometimes within days over a hundred investors come in and subscribe that. So it's just, the, it's the power of the technology that makes that all work. And, and I think the last thing that I would say is for what, what sponsors should understand coming in is that just like anything, this is, you know, while this has, it can have great results, the results really are what the sponsor puts into it. We have certain sponsors on the platform that have come and gone and raised a little bit of money and maybe had a decent experience, but not really embraced it. If they don't embrace the model, if it's not important to them, I get it. It doesn't need to be important to them. But to know that if it's not important to them and they're not really willing to put any resources behind it, then they raise a little bit of money and then they go away. And maybe that, that experience is... I raised $2 million on a deal, it was okay, and, and maybe I'll contemplate it again, maybe not. For the operator who comes in and says, this is strategic to my future, I believe I can raise some money today, I believe I can raise a lot of money tomorrow, and I think I can build long-term, substantial, lasting relationships through your platform, 
that's the kind of relationship that we're looking for, honestly, for both, because usually those operators are doing great deals and they're gonna, they're gonna do great by the investor, um, but that really that they're, they're, they're making this a part of their plan. And when they do put the resources behind it, that's where we've seen, I mean, there's a sponsor that we raised over $50 million for, we might raise over $100 million for that sponsor next year alone. And it was solely for the, per, for the reason that when they came, they got to know us, they flew out here, they spent a day and a half, meet, met with all the team, and they said, you guys, we raise a lot of money in a lot of channels, but this is going forward. We're your partner. We hope that you'll be our partner for the long run. And let's go out and build a long-term relationship and do great deals and deliver great returns to the investors. If the operator has that mindset, then I think one to two years from now, like sky's the limit and what's already happening is, is pretty substantial. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for, for explaining that and changing focus just a little bit. And, you know, when somebody comes to you and says, you know, I want to get into the syndication business, what's a couple of pieces of advice that you give them? Oh, yeah. Uh, if anyone wants to start syndicating deals, I think the first thing uh, that I, I would I would I would think about if I, if I kind of go back to the early days of me syndicating um, was one, you know, really think about um, think all the way through the deal before the deal even happens. Um, and the reason I say that is, you know, early syndicators oftentimes start with I want to go buy a deal and I want to raise capital. Um, but I think to be a good syndicator you really need to think about the long-term relationship that you're about to try to go forge with an investor. And the investor is going to expect you to be able to not only perform on the acquisition, they're going to expect you to, to perform on the reporting and execute the business plan, deliver a K1 on time and execute the, and then exit the property, you know, profitably. So I think sometimes I've seen in some lesser experienced groups that the, the, the full cycle thought process, of how are we really going to manage the property? How are we going to report to investors? And how are we going to make sure, particularly make sure that accounting is delivered on a timely basis? Because the, the worst thing you could possibly do is come out of the gate strong, deliver a great story, generate a ton of enthusiasm on your deal, and then fall flat with the, you know, by missing uh, an April deadline on a K-1. The investor two years later is gonna not remember everything that you said at the time that you did the deal. They're only gonna remember how you made them suspend and extend their tax return and perhaps pay a penalty. And that bad taste in their over what you know what you could have possibly will, you could have generated up front, and now you're playing from behind. And it doesn't take a ton of expertise to actually get it right. It just takes some thought process and some strategic planning and know who your partners are in terms of tax and legal and make sure those are good. They're set up, they're in line and then just don't drop the ball. If you, and then all you need to do is get through that one deal. And I guess that's the other, the other piece that I would really recommend to the, to the, uh, the new syndicator time. Do, do a great job on, a, on one deal and turn that one great deal into two to three deals and then, and then execute and then turn that two to three deals into seven or eight and all, and pretty quickly, you're going to have a great portfolio with a, with a rat, you know, a rabid following and just do what you say you're going to do. It's not more complicated than that. And before we have to go, tell us the number one thing that's contributed to your success. Oh, um, I'd say a couple things. One, in the early days, uh, when you're younger, tenacity, it's easy to get, you know, um, it, it's easy to get knocked down. Uh, when you're young, when you're getting out there, you're doing your first syndications, uh, you're putting yourself in front of people, you're kind of hanging it out there on the line. Uh, you got to be willing to, you know, A, you got to be willing to kind of uh, put your money where your mouth is. So put your money in your deal. Now you got to get out there and now you got to, you have to be tenacious. You got to, you got you to pitch to a lot of people. You got to tell your story. And I think part of the pitch is when, whenever I was talking about a deal, I guess when I was pitching a deal, I never really tried to sell the deal. I just tried to explain why, like, why I like the deal and what I'm trying to accomplish as a syndicator. 
Um, you know, be authentic. That's the other piece of this thing that you cannot underestimate the power of. Um, be willing to know what you know and say what you know and be willing to admit what you don't know and, and then follow up with those when those questions are asked and you don't have the answer. Uh, tell them you don't have the answer, but follow up with a good answer within a reasonable amount of time. Um, that's going to go a long way to engender support. And I'd say, you know, as I got a little further in my career, um, I think it was really, then it turns into really understanding what you are really best at. Everybody is amazing at some things and they have to be bad at other things. And nobody can be all things to everybody. So when you, once you get a little more experience in your career, it's really focusing on doing more of what you're best at and staffing and building the team around you for those skill sets that you know that you're weaker, weaker at. I think that was exactly what happened here at CrowdStreet. I mean, I come out of a real estate private equity background, and here I am now in a tech company. So I'm not a tech guy. I couldn't possibly build a tech platform. So I sought to partner with technology people and, you know, and online salespeople and, when, and product people. And when I saw the, the initial kind of brain trust coming together at CrowdStreet, I could recognize that the best skill sets around the table were so diverse, but yet they were so good at what everybody was good at. And then what they were looking for me to contribute was exactly what I was best at. And that's why I thought we had a winning recipe. And so here we, now, here we are now four and a half years later. Nice. It's great advice. Uh, Ian, tell the listener how they can learn more about you and about CrowdStreet. Sure. Uh, it, it's a couple of things. Easy. You can learn more. You can feel free to ping me directly. Uh, my email address is simple. It's just my first name, Ian, I-A-N, at CrowdStreet.com. Uh, check out our platform, www.CrowdStreet.com. Uh, we've got webinars that are always going on on a regular basis, investor-oriented webinars, sponsor-oriented webinars, you know, deal-oriented webinars. Uh, you know, please, please come check us out. And like I said, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to, to ping me by email. I would, I'd be happy to chat. I hope the listeners will, will connect with Ian and learn more about CrowdStreet. I hope you'll, you'll go to lifebridgecapital.com and, and connect with me and schedule a call and I'll help you any way I can. And I hope you'll go to the Facebook group where you can, you can see our, our upcoming guests and you can submit questions that you want me to ask. And so we can all learn this business together and, and grow together. And we will talk to each of you tomorrow. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.